Hello and welcome to episode 6 of Let's Translate Light Novels, where we are going to look over this light novel, Seiran Den, and I'm going to take translations submitted by my patrons, and I'm going to critique those translations and see what we can learn from it. But before we start, a disclaimer. The objective of this series is not to walk away with a finished translation of this novel. In actual fact, we're probably only going to get through the first several pages. The purpose of this series is to teach Japanese grammar and vocabulary. Additionally, the series objective is to show how you can take your understanding of Japanese and turn it into a proper translation. To demonstrate this, I'll be comparing and contrasting translations of this novel that I did in the year 2000, when I was at the intermediate level and completely new to translating, with translations from some of my patrons, as well as my insights today today as a professional translator with over 15 years experience. I do not own the rights to Seiran Den, and I did not get permission from the author Nishizaki Megumi to translate it, so again, I would like to emphasize that the intention of this video series is not to produce a translation of this book, but to teach Japanese and to show how translation can be done. I won't be naming my patrons who have contributed their translations in these videos, but I will credit them in the video description if they wish. And now, on to the video. All right, so for this month's videos in this series, I've got translations submitted from two different patrons, whom I will refer to as Patron A and Patron B, and I will be including also my translations that I did when I was 18 years old. I had had two years of high school Japanese, and I had been living in Japan for about five months at that point, uh, and it was like, aside from two volumes of manga, this is one of the first things I ever translated, not officially. <laughs> so it's not that great, which is good because uh, you can learn from good translations, but you can also learn a lot from bad translations. So let's get started. Uh, so, Japanese dialogue. Doko ni iku no? Taria no ato wo tsuite aruku ayuru ga sono se ni toi kakeru. Patron A translated this as, where are we going? Ayuru called to the back of the figure walking in front of him. Patron B translated it as, where are we going? Ayur called out to Talia's back as he trudged after her. And small Sarah, myself age 18, translated it as, where are we going? Ayuru asked Taria as he walked behind her. All right, let's look at these three sentences and just kind of compare and contrast. So everybody translated doko ni iku no as where are we going, which is interesting because it, it's not literally where are we going. It could be where are you going? Where do you think we're going? It, you could do a few different things with this, but we all went with where are we going? Ayuru called to the back of the figure walking in front of him. So in Japanese, it was sono se ni toikakeru, which is literally like asked her back, basically. There's so much of that in Japanese prose. The sight of his back walking away from me was distant or whatever. And we don't really do that in English prose. We don't mention people's backs as we're talking about them. So the figure walking in front of him works. Patron B uh, called out to Talia's back as he trudged after her. So patron B went with the more literal back. Um, and small Sarah just went with asked Taria as he walked behind her. So uh, small Sarah just left out the whole sono se ni. It, I just translated that as her instead of that back her. Uh, patron B left a footnote uh, on the verb trudged. So you may notice that um, the verb trudged is not used in here. It's just aruku, which is just generic walk. Um, the, pa the patron's footnote says, since I couldn't come up with a strong opening for this section, just using the word followed or whatever, it says more about Ayuru's attitude than the original text did, but I think it's fairly reflective of his emotional state in the rest of this section. And yeah, I, I agree with that. I think you could extrapolate from that that Tari is really excited walking on and Ayuru is a little more hesitant. So trudged does actually work pretty well here, even though in the Japanese it's neutral. Ooh. Before we move on, I do need to make a little note that at the end of the last section, there was a little asterisk that shows that time passes. And I mistakenly said in the last video that like that day, it's Ayuru's birthday. No, <laughs> the last section, it was not Ayuru's birthday. In this section, it is Ayuru's birthday. I think I was just looking ahead and seeing, oh, it's Ayuru's birthday in the next section. Therefore, it's his birthday that day. But no, um, this is actually two months after the last section we went over in Let's Translate Light Novels Part 5. So this has nothing to do immediately with a scene that came right before it. This happened two months after the last scene. So next line of dialogue. Ii kara, ii kara, kochi, kochi. Taria wa kamawazu karoyaka na shidori de zun zun susunde iku. Mori o hanbun kurai tsukitta tokoro made kite shounen no ashi ga pitari to tomatta. So the dialogue. Ii kara, ii kara, kochi, kochi. Uh, patron A translated that as, don't worry, just follow me. 
Patron B translated it as, you'll see, comma, or exclamation point, end quote, was all she said. It's this way. And then small Sarah translated it as, you'll see, you'll see, this way. And then both patron A and small Sarah followed it with a dialogue tag uh, for the description that came after it. So we all did that smart thing <laughs> where instead of just separating that next paragraph of description, the two sentences, Tariya wa kama wa yakana, that, that whole thing, we all in our own way tagged that into the dialogue, except patron B. Patron B um, added, basically, was all she said. Now, I think that one could uh, extrapolate was all she said from kamawadzu, that word. All right, so kamawadzu literally means like uncaringly, <laughs> like not caring about ayuru, asking where are we going. Um, dismissively, you could also think of it as. But it's, it's more carefree. It's not like, ah, I don't care about you. <laughs> but it's like, ah, it's, it's all good. Come on, just follow me. Trust me. <laughs> um, and karoyakana, um, it's like light carefree. So it, you can tell that her, her mood here is more like, ah, come on, Ayuru, just follow me. It's not like, come on, Ayuru, stop asking questions. It's, it's more lighthearted. Um, so was all she said does work okay here because of the kamawatsu. And then patron B started like a whole new sentence after that for the descriptive part. So let's look at the descriptive part. Patron A, Talia paid no heed to the hesitancy in his question and strode ahead with nimble footsteps. Reaching a dense part of the woods, the boy's footsteps came to an abrupt halt. Patron B, Talia's, Talia's <laughs> stride was carefree, but brisk. They made rapid progress into the forest until about halfway in, Ayur, Ayur suddenly stopped dead. And then small Sarah, when they got to a place about halfway, <laughs> halfway, that should be one word, halfway through the forest, the boy stopped abruptly. So let's compare these three descriptions. So Talia paid no heed to the hesitancy in his question and strode ahead with nimble footsteps. That would be the zun zun susundeiku. So zun zun is not a matapia that means rapidly. And then um, susundeiku is like to, to proceed through, to keep marching on, to keep walking. Patron B, Talia's stride was carefree but brisk. That's a very concise way of putting that. And again, because I think the kamawadzu goes into that dialogue tag earlier was all she said. Talia paid no heed to the hesitancy in his question is kamawadzu, basically. That's how patron A extrapolated kamawadzu. And this is valid as well. This whole kamawadzu is responding, like she doesn't care. Uh, pay, she paid no heed to Ayuru's question. The hesitancy in his question part was not in the original Japanese, that, that's adding a bit. Uh, but the start ahead with nimble footsteps is, is right from the Japanese. I think you don't need a paid no heed to the hesitancy in his question, just Talia paid no heed and start ahead. <laughs> like, or Talia paid no heed to Ayuru or to Ayuru's question and start ahead. Yeah, it's not necessarily a hesitancy in his question. Like he's walking behind her, so you could read that as he's hesitant, but uh, it's not necessarily. That's reading a bit much into it. Small Sarah, it's just a dialogue tag in Small Sarah's case. Taria continued to tromp on freely. Small Sarah just cut out the whole kamawatsu. <laughs> just like, eh. Um, and just, Taria wa karoyaka na shidori de zun 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 deiku. If you just cut out the kamawatsu, that's what Small Sarah interpreted this as. And that's also valid. I think the kamawatsu um, is kind of important. Uh, then the second part, reaching a dense part of the woods, the boy's footsteps came to an abrupt halt from patron A. Patron B, they made rapid progress into the forest until about halfway in, Ayur suddenly stopped, dead. Um, and then small Sarah, when they got to a place about halfway through the forest, the boy stopped abruptly. So small Sarah just cut out entirely the um, tsukita part of the sentence. So tsukiru is to cut through. So to cut through the forest, basically, to, to proceed quickly. Um, small Sarah just cut that part out entirely. She probably didn't know what Tsukiru meant and didn't feel like looking it up. <laughs> and was like, eh, they got to a place halfway through the forest. The boy stopped abruptly. Um, patron B, Talia's tribe was carefree but They made rapid progress into the forest. That works for Tsukita tokoro made kite. Mori o hanbun kurai. And patron A also left out uh, the hanbun kurai halfway into the forest. Although, um, patron A expressed that hanbun kurai as reaching a dense part of the woods. Um, I think what patron A was trying to do here is if you go halfway into the woods, it's probably going to be a dense part of the woods. Like if you're on the outskirts of the woods, it's going to be thinner. But if you're in the middle of it, it's going to be denser generally. So I think this was just patron A's choice to express hanbun kurai, 
uh, into the mori, halfway about into the forest, uh, would be a dense part of the woods. So, shounen no ashi ga pitari to tomatta, uh, literally the boy's feet stopped with a pitari sound effect, <laughs> which means like, you know, pta, like to, to suddenly stop. Patron A, the boy's footsteps came to an abrupt halt. Patron B, Ayer suddenly stopped dead. And small Sarah, the boy stopped abruptly. So uh, a general pet peeve I've heard um, from other writers or people who teach creative writing, and I, I've kind of taken this to heart. I do kind of agree with this. It's generally not a good idea to end your sentence with the adverb, the boy stopped abruptly. It's usually preferable to word it more like the boy abruptly stopped. Like, I think the way that sounds as I say it, the boy stopped abruptly does sound better in this case, but usually you want to put your adverb not at the end of the sentence. Uh, I hear suddenly stopped dead works better that way instead of stopped abruptly. Came to an abrupt halt, I think also sounds a lot better than stopped abruptly. And patron A and small Sarah translated shounen as the boy, and patron B just went with ayuru because that's him that we're talking about. Both are valid. All right, next line of dialogue. Doshitano hayaku. <laughs> Shoujo ga. I can like imagine that because the small u in there. Shoujo ga shounen no te o hippatte mata aruki dasu. Patron A. What are you waiting for? Hurry! Uh, she took him by the hand and started leading him deeper into the forest. Patron B. What are you doing? Let's go! The girl tugged at his hand and they began to walk again. And then small Sarah. What are you doing? Come on! The girl grabbed the boy's hand and they began to walk again. And I don't know why, but for some reason, small Sarah, like, put this one line of dialogue as two separate lines of dialogue, even though they're by the same person and they were together in Japanese. I don't know what happened there. Anyway, um, what are you waiting for versus what are you doing? Let's go. And what are you doing? Come on. Yeah, hayaku. Like, it, it literally means, like, quickly. <laughs> it's an adverb. It's like, quickly! Um, so yeah, you'd say hurry up or come on. Like, either of those works just fine. It's like, faster, hurry, let's go. All of those work for Hayaku. What are you waiting for versus what are you doing and what are you doing? Yeah, doshita no... Uh, to me, it, it usually reads a little more like what's wrong or what's wrong with you rather than what are you doing. Or it's like, why are you doing that? As in, why have you stopped walking suddenly in your tracks? So what are you waiting for works as well, because he stopped. So it's like, why did you do that? Stopping in your tracks. What are you waiting for? Uh, what are you doing works, but it's a little uh, vague. I like what are you waiting for here, because it adds a little more specificity that's definitely warranted. It's there. Patron A, she took him by the hand and started leading him deeper into the forest. So literally, like, the girl took the tugged on the boy's hand and began to walk again. It's like literally what that is. She took him by the hand and started leading him deeper into the forest. Patron B, the girl tugged at his hand and they began to walk again. This is very literal. This is like very much what it was in the original Japanese. And then small Sarah, the girl grabbed the boy's hand and they began to walk again. Again, uh, small Sarah was was like being a little overly literal with the shoujo shonen, the girl, the boy. <laughs> it's like we already know who these characters are. Like I think if we hadn't met these characters yet, like calling them the girl and the boy would have been a bit more warranted, but by now it's like, eh, it sounds weird. You sound like that weird assassin from Game of Thrones. If I do this thing, a girl must obey. A girl will obey. Uh, yeah, just call them by their names, or he and she. Like, the girl and the boy is kind of weird. Started leading him in deeper into the forest doesn't exactly make sense so much from patron A, because she was already leading him deeper into the forest. It's like, it's, it's more like she resumed. Uh, leading him deeper into the forest. Also, another, like, writing teacher pet peeve thing. Um, usually it's pretty weak to say started to do something or decided to do something, especially if it wasn't in the original Japanese. It's more like resumed rather than started. Um, Japanese. Shibaraku shite, futari no mae ni masa o na mizu o tataeta mizumi ga arawareta. So, patron A, a few moments later for shibaraku shite, patron B, before long, <laughs> and small Sarah, after a while. All means the same thing. Uh, patron A, a few moments later, a brilliant blue lake came into view before them. Came into view, arawareta, brilliant blue lake, masao na mizu o tataeta. So it's like, the Japanese is literally like, a lake filled with, <laughs> lake teeming with bright blue water. But yeah, reducing that to just a brilliant blue lake uh, works. Patron B, the deep blue waters of the lake spread before them. I like that for arawareta. 
instead of like, it's tempting if you see arawareta to translate that as appeared. <laughs> um, and that can get a little tricky and confusing because in English, appeared or appears can also mean um, seems like. It doesn't necessarily mean poof. <laughs> and then if you say something appeared, like before you, we do sometimes get that poof uh, vision in our minds. But arawareta, it's not necessarily it poof appeared before them, but it's like it came into view. It spread out before them. Uh, small Sarah, after a while, the two came upon a clear blue lake. So yeah, came upon, came into view, and spread before. All of those for Arawarata. Those are all good translations for Arawarata. Good job, us. <laughs> um, a, the deep blue waters of the lake from Patron B is a little more literal because they're talking about the water. Masao na mizu. I like that. It paints a better picture than just saying like a blue lake or a... Be deep blue lake or a brilliant blue lake. Small Sarah went with clear blue lake for Masaona. I, I dig it. But you got deep blue, clear blue, and brilliant blue for Masao. None of these are wrong. All right, and then we have a dialogue of just 18 dots <laughs> from Ayuru. And what I like here about this is none of us, not even Small Sarah, translated that as quotation mark, 18 dots, and quotation mark. We all uh, decided to extrapolate that or leave it out. So I'm going to go on to the um, Japanese narration that comes after that. Ayuru no kao ga kowatta. Sore ni kizukanai Taria wa shounen wo kouhan ni suwaraseru to chotto matete ne to sugata o keshita. This is interesting. You have this little like bit of dialogue in there that's like kind of nestled into the narration, but it's not officially like a Here's some narration, and then here's some dialogue, and then here's some more narration. And if you translate that literally, it's like from the shonen wo kohan part. Sitting the boy by the lake with a wait here for a little minute, she disappeared. <laughs> it's kind of like how you translate that literally, keeping the, the prose intact. Um, and it's very weird in English to do that. So let's see how we all did that. So Ayuru's face tightened from patron A. Ayuru no kao ga kowabatta. Wait right here, Taria said, not noticing this, as she ran off behind the trees. Patron A moved the um, chotto matete ne part a little earlier in there. Wait right here, Taria said, not noticing this, uh, sore ni kizukanai, Taria wa, as she ran off behind the trees. Patron B, Ayur's face was a silent mask, uh, instead of um, Titan. Kowabata, like, kao ga kowabata is more like, <laughs> it stiffened, it tightened. So was a silent mask is a bit of an extrapolation, but it's fine. Like if, if your face is a mask, like if, if, if you think of it that way, it's more like your face is stiff. Like any expression or emotion you're showing on your face at the moment is not yours. <laughs> so a silent mask does work here. He sat woodenly on the shore where Talia led him. That's not exactly what it said in Japanese. Yeah, so the order of operations is a little uh, switched up in Patron B's translation. It's not really a problem, I don't think. Uh, but just look at this. Um, in Japanese, the order of operations is Ayuru's face, kowabatta. It, it tensed up, it stiffened. Um, Sore ni kizukanai Taria wa. Taria didn't notice this. Um, so not noticing this, um, he, he's standing there, tense-faced. That's the first thing that happens. Then the second thing that happens is Talia doesn't notice it while she sits him by the edge of the lake. So the first thing that happens is his face tenses up. The second thing that happens is Talia obliviously <laughs> sits him down by the lake. And then she says, wait here just a minute. And then she walks away. That's kind of the order of operations here. Um, what patron B, uh, the translation implies that he was already sat by the lake. And like Talia wasn't the one who sat him there. She led him to the lake. And then I guess he sat down maybe on his own, maybe not. And his face was a silent mask. And then Talia said, wait right here. So it's, it's like just a tiny bit different than the order of operations in Japanese. Again, not in a way that like ruins the story or the moment or anything, but just note that it's a little different there. Wait here, okay, she said, all unconcerned and disappeared. <laughs> all unconcerned, the all in there is a little weird. All unconcerned is more like casual how you tell a story. And she was like, wait here, okay? She said, all unconcerned. And, and I don't know, the all is weird. Wait here, okay? She said, comma, unconcerned, comma, and disappeared would also be kind of weird. I think the all unconcerned part is a little clunky where it is. 
both patron A and patron B could have gone with a more literal, um, not noticing this, Talia said, wait here, okay, and disappeared. Like, even though that's like literally the, the order that it happened in the Japanese, I think that something like that does also work. Small Sarah went with um, Taria, comma, not noticing this, comma, sat him down at the edge of the lake with a, wait here a minute, okay, and disappeared. Oh, good job, Small Sarah, for doing the thing that I said not to do. <laughs> but see how weird that sounds? Like, it was pretty good. Um, at, at the first part of it, Taria, not noticing this, sat him down at the edge of the lake with a, wait here for a minute, okay, if, if she had just gone, if small Sarah had just done period at the end of the lake, Taria, not noticing this, sat him down at the edge of the lake, period. Wait here a minute, okay, comma, she said, and disappeared, or, or something like that, like even that's not perfect either, but like, uh, yeah, just the, uh, sat him down with a, wait here a minute, okay, <laughs> disappeared. It's like, if you say with a something or another in, in English, you wouldn't be like with a, and then there's a line of dialogue. It's like with a laugh, with a smile. Like it, it would be something like that. It wouldn't be something like with a, be sure to call me when you get home from work. You wouldn't like do a whole line of dialogue in there necessarily. Anyway, next line. Mori no oku ni hissori ikizuku kono chisana mizumi wa sono azayaka na kosui no iro kara so it's a big line of narration here, big long sentence. <laughs> Let's see how we all translated it. So patron A, this small lake, comma, tucked away deep in the forest, comma, was called Azure Lake because of the vivid hue of its water. Patron B, the small lake nestled deep in the forest was called Blue Lake for the vivid color of its waters. And then small Sarah, this small lake in the middle of the forest, comma, with its brilliant blue colored water, comma, had been named Aonomizumi. So here's a little peek behind the curtain of how I make these videos. I arrange the translations in a nice little table uh, that I can look at on my computer while I do these videos, but I actually make a point of it to like not read the translation super deep uh, before I do this video because I, I want my real time, like honest reactions to things. But I did notice uh, just as my eyes were kind of scanning over the translations as I was formatting them in the table that um, a couple things came up that is going to be the theme of this video, which you probably saw in the thumbnail. The issue of naming things, when to keep things in Japanese, when to translate things, what to translate things as, and just when you should do that, when you shouldn't do that. So note, Aonomizumi, that is the name of this lake. And note how each one of us translated it differently. Patron A went with Azure Lake, Patron B went with Blue Lake, and Small Sarah, what she did, which I think this is actually the best one. <laughs> Like, I'm not just saying that because I was the one that translated this. This is like super, super past Sarah. I have no emotional attachment to this translation. Um, but what small Sarah did, it's called explicitation. Um, so I'm going to go over that a little bit. So Aonomizumi, that's the name of the lake. It's an official name of a term. Much like in Shigeyugi, uh, Kuto is the country that this story takes place in. Um, it's translated everywhere, including like all the translations from all my patrons uh, thus far, it's been translated as kutol. It was not translated as anything, even though the kanji mean things. Uh, konan, that's another um, place in the Shigyugi world. Uh, konan, uh, in particular, if you look at the kanji for that, it literally means red south, uh, but it's not translated. It's, it's just kept as konan. But something like Aonomizumi, it, it is very clearly and literally like Blue Lake or the Blue Lake or the Lake of Blue. Um, Awo no Mizumi, you're turning Awo more into a noun than an adjective. So I think the Lake of Blue is a little bit closer to what this is rather than Blue Lake or Azure Lake. And here's why. It, it's just, you wouldn't talk about a lake. Like if I was sitting with somebody at a lake and we're speaking Japanese and I'd be like, hey, check out that blue lake. I wouldn't say, uh, <laughs> like, I'd be like, like, I wouldn't say necessarily. I would say, um, um, Awo no Mizumi is a little more poetic, much like in English, like a lake of blue is a little more poetic than blue lake. So that's one point. Another point though is because it is a proper name of a lake, 
Usually proper names of things in stories, especially if the story itself is like Japanese in nature, like Seiran Den kind of is, you generally want to default to keeping those terms in Japanese, unless it's like really, really important that we know what it means. And that, that goes into my um, explicitation comment that Small Sarah did. Um, had been named Ao no Mizumi hyphen the lake of blue. So I kept the name in Japanese, but then I explicitated, I made it explicit by saying the lake of blue. I don't think the patrons were wrong necessarily for translating it as Blue Lake or Azure Lake, because again, it's not like, it's not like Konan, where, you know, if the average Japanese person hears Konan, they don't like automatically think, aha, Red South, <laughs> you know? They think, oh, Konan, the name of a country, which happens to mean Red South. It's like, if people hear my name is Sarah, they don't automatically think, aha, that's Hebrew for princess. <laughs> Like, aha, the etymology of that name means princess. Like, most people don't think that, even though Sarah does, like, mean princess, like, etymologically speaking. Um, if a Japanese person were to hear Ao no Mizumi, they would think Blue Lake. They would not think, ah, Ao no Mizumi. So they're not wrong. Patrons A and B are not wrong for translating Ao no Mizumi as Blue Lake or Azure Lake. I personally, however, just prefer in this case, in this specific case, uh, to keep it in Japanese, Ao no Mizumi, and then explicitate it with adding basically the translation of it right after that, the Lake of Blue. So now that I've sung my former self's praises, <laughs> let's look at what patrons A and B did that were better than Small Sarah. So I like patron A's uh, for this Hissori Ikizuku um, thing. It, it like literally means to breathe quietly. <laughs> but like, it's a poetic way of expressing that this lake is secluded in a secluded part of the forest. And like, it's kind of in secret and it's, it's quietly. Like if you, you're personifying it a little bit, it's like tucked away, quietly breathing, quietly living secretly by itself sort of thing. So this language tucked away deep in the forest, I really like that, that paints a great picture. Uh, patron B nestled deep in the forest. I also like that. That has a nice, that paints a nice picture. Small Sarah was just like, this lake in the middle of the forest. <laughs> it's another example, I think, of Small Sarah looking at Hisori Ikitsuku. What does that mean? I don't know. I'll just cut it out. So, <laughs> so, Patron A, uh, because of its vi because of the vivid hue of its water, azayaka, vivid. Uh, patron B uh, was called Blue Lake for the vivid color of its waters. I like waters instead of water. Waters again, it just sounds a little more poetic. And then there's a footnote <laughs> which we'll go over. And then um, Small Sarah went with brilliant uh, blue colored water, brilliant for azayaka. I think Vivid's a little bit better than Brilliant. But let's look at the, the footnote from Patron B. Um, I really, really wanted to join this up with the next paragraph and smooth out the overall description some, but I think the author may have deliberately made this whole section kind of disjointed to reflect Ayuru's um, disassociated thinking during the scene, so I kept the paragraph break. Yeah, I think um, looking at this paragraph and the next one, I think that this narration is really more just the, the narrator, like the author of the book, uh, talking about the lake and explaining the significance to the reader. I don't think it's necessarily through Ayuru's eyes. But again, in Japanese uh, books, even if there is a paragraph break in there, you don't have to include it. Uh, you can you can stick things together. But anyway, here's the next paragraph. Fudanは誰も訪れることもないこの場所にはいつもピンと張り詰めたような厳粛な空気が漂っている。I read that very robotically. <laughs> I just wanted to put some pauses between the words. So that's one big long sentence. And then there's another big long sentence after that. And then there's a big m dashy thing after that and a period. So it's kind of like a, I'm ending this poignant thought right here. Which again makes me think, okay, this is the narrator sort of having a little aside. Hey reader, let me let me give you some valuable information about this lake. Th these characters already know all of this, but I'm I'm telling you about it. This is exposition. So let's look at the translations. Patron A. This secluded spot always had such a solemn atmosphere. That was sentence one. Shortened it quite a bit. For that reason, it was considered the most hallowed of places for Ayuru and the rest of the Heen tribe. Patron B. Most of the time, it was a place no one came, 
and an atmosphere of tense solemn, so, solemnity. <laughs> I'm so bad at reading. And an atmosphere of tense solemnity always hung over it. Unsurprising, given that to Ayur's Litoran people, this was the holiest of places. And then small Sarah, this place that was seldom ever visited, always seemed to be tense with a solemn air. Mm, so many Japanese-isms in that. We'll unpack that in a minute. But this place held a sacred importance to Ayur and the hen race. I like that sentence. That's a good one. All right, so let's look at the first sentence. Kama. So ordinarily, the, this, this place, no one comes to this place. Kama. So this place to which people don't ordinarily come, comma. Itsumo pinto haritsumeta yona genshuku na kuki ga tatayotte iru. So genshuku na kuki is a solemn vibe, a solemn atmosphere. Um, and then tatayotte iru is floating, uh, wafting. You, you could interpret that verb lots of different ways other than just floating. So this secluded spot always had such a solemn atmosphere. This is so clean and so lovely. Um, so secluded. That word came from was translated as secluded. That's brilliant. I like it so much. Um, in past videos, if you've watched the rest of the videos in the series, you'll note that Japanese prose does this a lot, and it's so clunky, and it's really hard to translate, and you almost should never keep it intact because it's clunky. So, kono ni wa, if you just delete fudan wa dare mo ototsureru koto mo nai, if you just delete that, and just go, kono basho ni wa, itsu mo pinto haritsumete yona, it's like, this place always had such a um, solemn atmosphere to it. Pinto uh, shita, like kind of, ping, silent, neat as a pin, <laughs> kind of atmosphere to it. Um, but then when you add this, Hunama, Darimo Otosereru Kotomo Nai, Kono Basho, um, small Sarah interpreted that as this place, comma, that was seldom ever visited, comma, always seemed to be tense with solemn air. And it's clunky. See how clunky that is when you in, when you keep it as it is in Japanese? I like the best you could do is that was is just so clunky in particular. The best I could have done with that is this place, seldom ever visited always seem to be tense with the solemn air, something similar to that, and like not that was, that was just sounds terrible. Um, but yeah, translating fudama daremo tosereru koto mo nai as secluded is great, because if, if people don't ordinarily come there, secluded works. <laughs> um, I don't know, like unvisited is, is like, is a little more literally what that would be, but I really like secluded. It, it does the job, it does the job of that, and it's, it's so clean. And yeah, as you can see, Patron B had a little trouble with that. Most of the time it was a place no one came. And then there's a footnote, meh. <laughs> there's got to be a really succinct English word for this kind of place somewhere. Yeah, and I agree. This is, this is the sort of thing where you might want to workshop it and think, okay, how, what's another way of wording? A place where people don't ordinarily come. I think the secluded spot works. I think this, this unvisited spot, um, it's like a road less traveled sort of thing. This uh, uninhabited doesn't work for this particular scenario, but yeah, you want to think along those lines. Uh, patron A always has such a solemn atmosphere, patron B, and an atmosphere of tense solemnity always hung over it. I like that it just sounds more, it sounds more like what it's trying to say. This passage is trying to say this place is so hollowed, it's so sacred. Uh, so I think a little poetry is called for here. Had such a solemn atmosphere is very matter of fact. Um, small Sarah always seemed to be tense with a solemn air, so this seemed to be. Um, Harisumeta yona, <laughs> this whole yona thing, I want to shoot it with a slingshot. Um, all these yona, if you keep it as seemed as, it's just, it's kind of weak in the translation. Always seemed to be tense with a solemn air. You don't need seem to be necessarily. Was always tense with a solemn air. Always seemed to be, I don't know, in this case, always seemed to be tense works okay. You don't always need to cut that out, but yeah, it's it's generally a little overdone if you always translate yo na as seem to be or as if. Uh, I like the atmosphere of tense solemnity always hung over it, even though I have a hard time saying solemnity. <laughs> so the, the next sentence, this is where a lot of controversy happens. So, sore mo sono hadzu, and it's like, and of course it would be solemn and tense. Uh, because, koko wa ayuru tachi hinzoku ni totte. So to Ayuru's tribe, the Hinzoku, uh, the Hin clan, the Hin race, the Hin tribe, motto mo shinsei na basho de aru no dakara. 
Uh, so because this this place is like the most sacred place for Ayuru's Heen race, Heen tribe. Patron A, for that reason, it was considered the most hallowed of places for Ayuru and the rest of the Heen tribe. Hi, Ayuru and the rest of the Heen tribe? The rest of the sounds kind of weird. Uh, Ayuru and the Heen tribe? I don't know, the rest of it's not that bad. So I didn't catch this when I was uh, filming the video, I just wanted to insert here, that um, the cause and effect is backwards here. For that reason, it was considered the most hallowed of places for Ayuru. Uh, it's actually the other way around. It's not a hallowed holy place for Ayudu and the Heen tribe because it was secluded, but it's the opposite. The spot is secluded and people don't go there that often because it's a hallowed place for Ayudu and the Heen tribe. So cause and effect are backwards here. Patron B will come back to it in a minute. Small Sarah, but this place, it, it's not but, that's wrong, small Sarah. <laughs> it's more like because. But this place held a sacred importance to Ayuru and Hin race. Sacred importance. I like hallowed from Patron A. That's great. It, it has that holy, sacred, uh, but yeah, it's not but. <laughs> it's because. It's like, and of course, like, and why wouldn't this place um, feel solemn? It's like the most sacred of places to the Heen race. So Patron B. Unsurprising that that, that is like, sore mo sono hazu. It's like, but of course. It's like, unsurprising, given that to I use Litoran people, this was the holiest of places. So this is the holiest of places. This works as well. The most hallowed. I like hallowed. I don't know. I think that's just me. Uh, holiest works, sacred works, hallowed. So this is where we get into some controversy. So there's a footnote, but fans will probably hate this choice for Hinzoku. Explanation is too long for a footnote, so I'll put it on a new page below. So there's a long explanation for why Patron B chose to translate Hinzoku as Latoran people. So the direct transliteration of Hin seems to be pretty standard in fan wikis, so I'd assume that the term has been localized in that way in some official Shigeyuki material somewhere. Yes, it has. Um, I think, at least in the fan subs, it definitely was. I'm pretty sure it was. Um, obviously, an official translation of Seidan Den would want to stay consistent with whatever name is established in other official sources, or at least what's already well known in the fan community, but for purposes of this practice exercise, I'm pretending that no such precedent exists and I'm having to go through the localization process from scratch. So yeah, um, we're setting the parameters here for the justification. <laughs> so for sure, if you're assuming you're doing an official translation of this light novel off of existing translations of the franchise in which Heen was translated as Heen, you would definitely want to keep it as Heen just for consistency's sake. But since this is not an official translation and, you know, we're, we're just kind of thinking outside the box here and we're thinking, well, for the purposes of this exercise, let me explain why I think that, um, this is patron B's words, let me explain why I think um, translating it as uh, Latorin is correct. I personally, spoiler alert, do not think this is a good idea and I'll explain why. Like, I agree with the premises of, of this argument, but I disagree with um, the application in this particular instance. So, these are the justifications that Patron B gave, gave for changing Heen to Latorin. Uh, or, uh, in Patron B's defense, they weren't necessarily like sold even on Latorin either, uh, but they just feel that Heen is not correct, you know, good for this, set, and it should be something different. So the first justification is, most English speakers would pronounce it wrong anyway. It looks like it should be read to rhyme with pin in English. You could choose a weirder spelling to try to nudge people closer to the original pronunciation, but I'm not sure if that's there's an unambiguous way of spelling it other than maybe heen, H-E-E-N, and that looks kind of silly to me. I agree that heen, H-E-E-N, looks really silly. So this, this argument is, I, I don't know, I just, I don't think this is an argument because with this logic, you should change the spelling of every uh, name ever <laughs> that comes up in anime or anything because, because everything is mispronounced by fans. Like the name Nakago, the name Miyaka, the name, uh, like, the country Kuto, Konan, like, all of those things, all of those words are mispronounced by fans. And pronouncing it Hin instead of Heen, like, whatever, who cares? <laughs> it's like, all fans mispronounce everything in, in these properties. I don't, I don't think it's a big deal that they mispronounce it either, especially if it's in a book where you're not even necessarily reading anything out loud, you're just seeing it. Uh, so I don't, I don't even think this is really a viable argument for most cases. Most cases. So I'm going to give a counterexample where I agree with this principle sometimes. I was re-watching Madoka Magica recently with my husband, and since my husband does not like subbed anime, he prefers dubs, we were watching the dub. And 
older dubbed anime is not not that great all the time. It's a little spotty. Sometimes it's really good, sometimes it's not. Madoka Magika's dub was <laughs> uh, but because um, it was done in the early teens. Dubs today of anime are amazing, by the way. You should watch them. Anyway, um, there's a character Mami in Madoka Magika. M-A-M-I. And in Japanese, it's a perfectly normal sounding name, uh, Mami. But in English, <laughs> in the dub, it sounds like they were calling her mommy, as in like their mother, right? Because mommy, ma, ma. Note how the vowel's a bit brighter in Japanese. Ma versus ma in, in English. Mommy versus ma, mommy. Uh, but it sounds like the actors were just calling her mommy all the time, which was so weird and, and awkward, and it did not work. So like in that particular instance, I think one could make a pretty good case for like, hey, we should change this character's name a little bit so that it's not, so it doesn't sound like mommy, because that's just awkward. <laughs> uh, in this case, though, I just don't think that argument really holds up, because again, it's a book, you're not reading it out loud, voice actors are not saying the words, and it doesn't really matter if you're mispronouncing Heen. Uh, the second argument was, it looks a lot like the English word Hindu, which doesn't seem like it's the best thing to associate with a demon-worshipping minority group. I agree that Hindu is not the best thing to associate with a demon-worshipping minority group, but I disagree that it looks too much like Hindu. It's it's pretty different, man. Uh, Hin is three letters, Hindu is five letters. Like, I could see if the Hin race were called, like, the, the Hindu race with, like, two U's. Or, or the Hindu race, or the Hindu with an M instead of an N, then I could definitely see a justification like, yeah, that does look an awful lot like Hindu. And I have another story. Um, I can't give exact details of it because it's about a game I'm working on that's under NDA. But yeah, there I, I'm working on a game that's under NDA, and it's a, it's a game that's been around for a very long time. So we want to keep these translations consistent. But there's one term that we had to change uh, slightly. We changed the spelling of it. Um, because, and again, I can't give the specifics because then I'll give away the game that I'm working on. But basically, the, the character uh, in this game uh, is too much like something that would upset a lot of people. <laughs> so we had to slightly change the spelling of this already established character that has like legacy, like ways of spelling it. We had to change it um, because of something that came up uh, in pop culture recently where we're like, oh, it's too similar to this other thing. Now we have to change that slightly so people don't have that bad association. So that there is a precedent for this. Like in certain situations, yes, you do want to change the spelling of words that could, that are just a little too close. Another example, Scott Pilgrim, uh, how they were talking about how Pac-Man, it was supposed to be Puck-Man, but that looks too similar to uh, the letter F. <laughs> the P, if you just change the P to F, it turns into something really bad in English that they wouldn't want, you know, the marketing people would not want people to make that association, so they change it to Pac-Man. So there is precedent for that. Uh, but I don't think in this case it's necessary at all. I think it's it's far away enough from Hindu that it, I, I, I don't think people would draw that association. And then the third justification that this patron had for changing it is the name Hin is more than just a sound. It would have some amount of meaning apart from the sound to native Japanese readers. So you're discarding that information if you just transliterate the sound. Um, so I agree with this in some very specific cases. But generally speaking, if, if it's a place, if it's a person or a place or something very official in, in an anime or a manga or a light novel, especially if it's very Japanese adjacent, which this thing is, the best thing to do is usually to keep it in Japanese. Um, now, the name Heen is more than just a sound. It has a meaning. Argument, this kanji is obscure. <laughs> like most Japanese people, like if they see this kanji, especially with, with Zoku after it, they wouldn't automatically think, oh, that means, like, it. they would know that it has something to do with water. Like, I don't even know what this kanji means. Let me look it up. Umiyamizumi no, okay. Yeah, so it's like a land associated with the ocean or the lake. Yeah, and like waves and stuff like that. Flowing water. It's similar to hama, from like, as in from Yokohama. But yeah, it's not a very common kanji. Uh, most Japanese readers, if they saw that, also another giveaway is the kanji has furigana in it, in the book. And usually if a kanji has furigana, that means it's not as likely that the, that the average reader of that grade level would know that kanji. And this book is written for like junior hires that are thereabout. So it's actually not a very common kanji, this hin kanji. 
So like, yeah, it does technically have a meaning, but again, going back to the example of my own name, like, sure, the etymology is princess, but most people, when they hear Sarah, they don't think princess. <laughs> so even though, like, places sometimes have meanings, again, Konan, it literally means Red South, but I don't think the average Japanese person hears Konan and then they think, aha, Red South. <laughs> like, it's kind of like an Easter egg. And, and you could, like, think, oh yeah, technically that country means Red South. That's cool because it's in the South and it's, and Suzaku has red imagery. So that makes a lot of sense. What a cool little Easter egg. But yeah, I don't think it needs to be that in your face. Like, this is what it means. If it were super, super important, I think, to know what he means, then you could make a more of an argument for translating it. But yeah, it is literally the name of his tribe. So I don't think... Like, I think that's the sort of thing that you really should keep in, in the original language. Yeah, it's like, if you were to go with uh, a localization of it, it would be better to just, like, I don't know, just make up something. <laughs> <laughs> like the lake tribe. Uh, uh, yeah, something like that. Uh, another thing that you could have done, I think a, a compromise or a happy medium that you could do if you, if you as a translator really wanted to um, express to the reader what heen actually means, uh, so that they can have that. You could always do use explicitation like small Sarah did with the, um, the lake of blue, uh, Aonomizumi hyphen, the lake of blue or whatever. You could do that with the heen race as well or the heen tribe. But yeah, I, I disagree with uh, in this particular instance of translating heen as like something else different. Well, my throat is sore, so we must be at the end of an episode. Be sure to tune in later in the month for part seven of Let's Translate Light Novels, where we will look at these two patrons and small Sarah's translations of more of this book. Uh, thank you to all of my patrons for supporting this and the other series on my channel. If you want a chance to be one of the patrons who submits translations uh, for this series, there's still a chance if you join my Patreon now at the $12 level. You can submit translations for June's episode of Let's Translate Light Novels. So if you're watching this after May or June, too late, um, maybe it's still going on and you can submit for a different month. Let's zip on over to my Patreon and join at the $12 level. At the very least, you get like access to the passages a month in advance and you can try your hand at translating them on your own. You don't have to send them to me and just uh, see how it compares to everyone else's translations. Anyway, thank you to the patrons, especially Greg, Henry Roaming, Leigh, Datafox, and Charpixie.